I'm going to invite up uh, Mike, Mike Kennebrook. So we're going to have a little chat on stage. Uh, come on up, Mike. I'll introduce you in a sec. We, we, we carefully coordinated our, our dress code. Uh, I did my best to. I, I want to be you, Mike. You've changed, man. Yeah, really? <laughs> you got started. Do I sit on a tiny X? I think we sit in the tiny X. All right. It's kind of cozy. Uh, so do you tinker with stuff like that? Like, did you ever get back in the codes and on the keyboard and code some stuff? Uh, did, did I or do, do or I do still? do you currently? Uh, yeah, occasionally. Yeah, yeah. I tend to start very ambitious projects at uh, 6.30 on a given Thursday night when I've got the shits with something. And then four weeks later when I come back to that tab, I'm like, oh, I really, yeah, I just throw it away. So it doesn't, doesn't go very far generally nowadays. Okay, so like most people know you, uh, Mike Cannon-Brooks, uh, you're the co-founder and co-CEO of Atlassian. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong with some of these stats, but founded in 2002, uh, you've got over 2,000 staff across the world now, mostly here in Silicon Valley, is that right? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, mostly. Is it half and half? No, 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 no. It's about 1,000 people here, and between uh, Mountain View and San Francisco, it's probably 500, so yeah, three quarters between yeah. the two. Uh, you've got roughly 85 of the 1,400 companies as customers. That's pretty good. Uh, over half a billion dollars in total sales. Also pretty good. Uh, still growing at 50% a year, I think. Uh, is that right? That's about right. Uh, yeah, the, the half a billion would be in US dollars to use yeah. my correct public company hat. And 50% uh, a year is probably a bit high. Am okay. I? Um, like uh, 30s right now. I had a look at the, uh, the stock market this morning, so 8 billion US in market cap as of this morning. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Okay, yeah, <laughs> just checking like, sure. how closely you, you, you watch that. Uh, you get tons of awards. What's it, what's it going to be in five years' time? That's, uh, I, I, can I, you tell me that? We, no, we can't tell. I, I need to sign, get them all to sign a disclosure. Um, now, one of the most impressive things, you have four kids under six, is that right, roughly? Uh, six and under, technically. Six yeah. and under. Yeah. So you are busy. <laughs> so look, th thanks for coming along. Put them at the top of the list, really. Yeah, I know. Uh, that's probably the, the biggest achievement. Um, all right, let's start. I mean, there's a bit we were going to get through. We've got about 15 minutes. So, um, so how, how does, I mean, Atlassian's done all this incredible stuff, uh, as you have. Uh, you know, I've seen much of you in that, on, on that journey. Uh, you're kind of where everyone wants to be, I think, in this room. But how does the Atlassian of today compare to the Atlassian that you and Scott thought of or conceived when you launched it in 2002? Um, that's a good question. It, um, look, it's nothing like the Atlassian of 2002. Uh, let's face it, that was two uh, numbnuts in a, in a back of an office, <laughs> back of Nikki's office, actually. Uh, so that, that, that was nothing like this. I think the first few years, we really set a cultural tone for how we wanted to operate as a company, and that's uh, but by and large, been maintained, which is really good from a values perspective. Culture has kept changing as it does, um, but the values have been fairly constant. Um, the ambition, if I get a bit meta here, I would say the ambition is still there. It's a very different ambition than what it was at each different period of time. Um, sort of, if you, if you think you have about a five year lens realistically, you're bullshitting yourself because it's probably two years, but you can sort of stretch that to five. Um, Every five years, our ambition has actually kind of gone up, as I think the best companies do. As you see what you've done and then what you could do, you either kind of settle for what you've done or you keep re-raising the ambition yeah. level. So that's um, probably similar, but obviously the ambitions of what we're trying to do today versus back then radically. But what's remarkable with you guys is like you and Scott appear to have basically grown at the same level as each other. So often in co-CEO relationships, one will outstrip the other, but you guys seem inseparable. Uh, sure. Um, dumb luck. Number one, <laughs> uh, hard work, number two, and understanding that self-scaling is the hardest part, right? Uh, we're pretty hard on ourselves, I think, um, as much as anybody else is in terms of we have to scale. If we don't scale, you know, the, the, the corks at the top of the bottle or whatever, the whole thing's going yeah. to slow down. So we've had to do that, and that's, you know, that's, that's challenging, right? So, but, but that point about your ambition changing, I mean, do you actually sit down every few years with Scott and say, look, let's... You know, just you and him almost. Let's set the uh, you know next next level of ambition. Yeah, yeah. No, we've done that a fair few times now. Um, you know, three or four times we we, we have found our offsites. We'll go away for a day or two and just hang out, drink some wine, and and you know recalibrate. Um, famously, probably in two thousand and eight nine, we did it. So we're about seven years in. 
we had a founder offsite which was like, look, we're seven years in, it's probably not going to go tits up at the moment. What do we want to do now? Like, it was almost like there's this weird belief that actually what you've kind of been aiming for comes true, and then you're like, shit, now you're fear fearful. Um, I've used the analogy before of rock climbing, you know, you start by looking at the wall and going, oh, geez, that looks high, let's have a go. It's only when you get like halfway or three quarters of the way up, you're like, oh, I could make it. And then you look down, you're like, oh, shit. Now the pain of looking down is totally different to what it was on the floor. Um, so that was when we decided that we were both seven years in. We both took a big break, um, uh, a few months, sort of round 30. All these things hit simultaneously, got married, um, and, and kind of had that big re-sync. Um, and that was a really positive thing, right? I encourage founders to do that. Every so often you need to step out of the office and kind of are we doing, are we here to do what we said we were going to do? And if we need to change something, what do we change? And part of that was both of us said, actually, we're more excited about the 10 years ahead than the sort of seven or eight years behind. Okay, great. What do we need to go do? And that's when we brought on Excel and sort of made plans to go public and all those sorts of things because yeah. it was at that point we could see the top of the wall, um, you know, and then that top of the wall is, is ever elusive. Yeah. So I get, so ambition has changed and evolved over, over that period, but uh, my observation of you guys is culture probably hasn't. Um, so maybe just a, a point in culture. I mean, I, one of the best things about my job, I, I get to do this quite a lot. So I, you know, I've interviewed Joss from Tyro, Cliff from Canva, Rod from Zero, etc. I mean, like, and the, the, the common theme amongst all of their companies is just this this commonality in culture. It's like each culture is different, but it's universally acknowledged within the organisation and rigorously enforced. So I mean, tell us about the Atlassian culture. Um. Look, it's harder to find culture. Um, you know, Scott's pretty, pretty, um, you know, um, known for you know the sort of culture eat strategy for breakfast quote. He, he rolls out a lot, and I think it is totally true. Um, the culture has kept changing in the business, right? A two thousand person company has a different culture than a two hundred person company and a twenty person cult company, and you shouldn't fight that. Um, we have more processes and more. Um, you know, uh, advantages and disadvantages of being a big company, and you should know and appreciate both. That doesn't mean the underlying values of the company and the way people interoperate with each other, um, the way the organization attracts certain types of people and hopefully repels, if you've done the right job, the other type of people. Um, whether they're inside or outside, they should get repelled, if you know what I mean. Um, I think that's the part that we fought really hard to maintain. Um, on the interpersonal level, um, and then as a business, et cetera, we are a product-driven company, and we have to understand what that means. I think it's very hard to change your DNA as a company. It's very, very, very hard to, to change your DNA. You find other potential business avenues that fit the DNA you already have, rather than changing it. If you look at great companies, they tend to tend to do that really, really cleverly, um, as Amazon has. Yep. Um, and that's what we, you know, we need to make sure to maintain. And understanding your own DNA is, is quite hard. So how much of your day-to-day -day existence is spent on that cultural piece? I mean, give us a, a glimpse into the um, day in the life of Mike. Oh, it varies on different weeks, right? Uh, I think one of the most powerful things that Scott and I can do is to be cheerleaders. So we're ever encouraging small groups of people. Scott just went around the world and did a sort of a world tour for t a week and a half. And that's brutal. At any time, you know, you're going to, he was in Barcelona, Amsterdam, New York, Austin, San Francisco, Mountain View, you know, do it all that in a week. It's a lot of travel. You get used to that. Yeah, it sounds, but it's incredibly it valuable. Glamorous, but it's, not, it's not glamorous at all. Um, it, it's incredibly valuable just to sit down with small groups of people and for them to hear firsthand. And the storytelling aspect of growing a company is incredibly hard. Um, so I think we try to do as much of that as possible and manufacture opportunities to do that. That's probably the biggest thing we do values-wise. Otherwise, the biggest thing we do values-wise, to be honest, is hiring like, and, and really scrutinizing hires and making sure that we're still attracting the right type of people um, at a macro level. Um, so how, how many interviews would you do in a week? Um, oh, probably two or three on average, I guess, something yeah. like that. Um, but by the time they get to me, they're, they're usually you know, quite well scrutinized. So I shouldn't be when I say hiring, I shouldn't be getting 50% strike rate at that point and saying culturally they're a misfit, yeah. right? So that, that has to come on the back of those yeah. you know, in the long term. But I'd certainly agree, process. like culture and hiring, two probably the most important things you can do in a, in a business. Uh, all right, let's talk about startups. Um, I mean, I know y you love startups. Uh, you're, you're in one, uh, <laughs> a big startup. Uh, and you're a pretty a active investor now. I think I saw you quoted saying that you've now put sort of nine figures of your own wealth into your own startups. You're in um, Blackbird, you're in 
Probably uh, closing on 10, but don't ten, tell me okay. why. <laughs> uh, yeah, so wh wh why, wh why do you love startups and, and what's your observation of what's going on in this sector here? Um, oh, that's a big question. Uh, I mean, they're exciting. They're, there's, there's a lot of, you, you, they attract a certain um, breed of people that I like hanging out with, I guess. People who are Does like... Want to change the world? Uh, it's funny. I, I actually don't like the phrase "change the world" because I don't think often they do. They just they just want to solve a problem, or do, you know, they, you can always zoom out and glamorize that, right? And Silicon Valley TV show, you know, parodies the zooming out part of it. Um, and it's not that it's untrue. It's more just that usually they're like annoyed by something and they want to go fix it. And the right ones have that annoyance, but also the hustle and the scrappiness to be able to make that happen and get together, right? And they're just really generally interesting people to hang out with um, and spend time on. Um, and, and obviously, you want to precipitate some of that change and, and drive to move in a, in a yeah. different direction. Obviously, I'm sort of in a, um, a luxurious position to be able to pick and choose. You know, you mentioned I don't have an investment committee, which is uh, uh, both a good and a bad thing, potentially, right? Like, it, it can be very dangerous not to have an investment committee, but... Um, well, you've also got a day job, Mike. So you sure, yeah, sure. Stay focused. That's right. Um, but I have, you know, I can make very quick decisions and follow through on passion projects, perhaps, uh, yeah. better than other people can. Okay, last question then. I want to talk about the 1% uh, pledge. So, I mean, there's a bunch of kids, or high school kids in the, in the room here. You've got four kids. Uh, I mean, what do you want them to do and what advice would you give to the, uh, to the girls and boys here today? Um, geez, that's a big question. Uh, I mean, I guess from my point of view, I want them to be happy and good, good citizens. I don't know how you put that, but like, um, you know, good people, right? I think fundamentally that's probably most important, I'm sure, for the high school kids. I don't know how you change that if it's not there. Hopefully, you are good people. Um, they all seem nice in the way in. Yeah, I think yeah. that's the parenting thing, right? Yeah, yeah. How do you bring up just, you know, decent human beings is the, the biggest thing, and then that they have some passion that they're driving after. It doesn't really matter what it is, necessarily. Um, I'm not definitely trying to shepherd them into tech or out of tech or into startups or any of that type of thing. I think it's up to them to choose that But it's definitely path. A, a valid and viable career path. Oh, it's an absolutely valid and viable career path. Don't, don't get me wrong, no, it's, it's a great career path and a very exciting life and I think it's a good, um, how would I phrase this? It's a great learning environment. I would say, you know, the first startup Nikki and I ran in 12 months, we learned so much in 12 months that we could never have packed into 10 years of a career at somewhere else, right? That, that if you're open to it mentally, the hyper-compressed learning that a startup can give you, it'll never get you a degree on paper, but it will literally learn every part of every business from customer operations to product creation to finance, accounting, investing, like ROI, everything that you have to learn, managing people, coaching people, it all comes at you very, very hard and fast. And you'll probably royally fuck it up for a few times, but you know that the pace of that learning is very, very high, so I think that part's really important. Um, I do generally advocate for people, there's sort of this startup clinging on thing, which is like, I really want to be in startups, and you say, well, why? Right, the best entrepreneurs I've invested in absolutely never you know, give away some of the secret sauce. If you talk to me about an exit, there's the door, um, number one. And number two, if you talk to me about why you really want to be an entrepreneur, no, there's the other door, right? Because the best people I've met never, never ask any of those questions, right? They're almost like, well, I really didn't want to do this, but no one was solving this problem, and I really want to work on this for 10 years and all this sorts of, like, that gets you much more excited. Yep. And so we sort of have this, you've got to be careful of people who are like, I really want to be involved in this community because of the community. I'm like, that, that doesn't make any sense to me, right? They didn't come to solve a problem. They didn't, they didn't sort of arrive for the right reasons, and I'm just very wary of, I would encourage people not to do that because it looks exciting, you know, or yep. I really like Facebook or something, and you're like, well, that's just a weird reason. Um, I think Snapchat, yeah. whatever, sorry, whatever's <laughs> under Snapchat, it's gonna be cool soon. <laughs> uh, I really wanna hear about the Pledge 1%. So, I mean, there was a little um, stand outside, uh, so people wearing t-shirts signing up. So what is Pledge 1% uh, and why is it so important to you and Scott? Sure. Um, yeah, look, we've had a, um, a foundation for a long while. I think, uh, um, you know, writ large corporate social responsibility or writ small companies' role in society is a really important thing. Um, if you think about various societal institutions um, uh, sort of slowly fading from from churches to neighborhoods and all these things, if you look at the last 50 or 100 years, I think companies have a, a really interesting role to play going forward in being some sort of stewards for social responsibility. This is very conflicted. If you look at the ASX rules, for example, which is profit over everything, it gets, it gets very complicated very quickly. Um, but we've had a foundation for a long time, right? Um, 
And in doing that, the foundation's done a lot of amazing things. Uh, we've, you know, $10 million plus and, you know, quarter of a million kids and all sorts of things. We focus on education and all sorts of different things, right? Uh, but in doing the foundation, we're, we're big scale guys, right? Like, we think about scale and how do we... I don't want one of these things, let's make it 10. Hey, if we could get 10, how could we get 100? And that's where the pledge 1% kind of came from. Um, we borrowed our foundation model off Salesforce, uh, which is that the Alassian Foundation has 1% uh, of the equity in the company, 1% uh, of employee time, 1% of profits, and 1% of product. You can define that different ways in different companies. Um, and we sort of borrowed some of that ingredients from Salesforce, and then we, a few years ago, were talking with them and, and Scott and Mark got together and said, hey, look, why don't we just turn that into a thing? Because a lot of other companies come to us and say, how did you start the foundation? What did it mean? And the idea is that pledging 1% of your company at the start doesn't cost you anything. You don't notice it, right? You've got nothing, so 1% of that, yeah, sure, I'll give that away. And trying to productize it into a pledge that other people can take on their startups, um, and it's just kind of escalated from there. It's been so really what year was that you started it? Um, so I think it's been around about three years now, probably a okay. year before that was the conversations. Um, we've had about 2,000, some startups from small to very, very large, a number of public companies have taken the pledge now, which is really exciting. Um, and we just try to get the message out there that it's a really good way to magnify our foundation's impact, I suppose, um, to share the lessons that we've had and then give people tools or a product that they can take into their uh, uh, startup, whatever it is. Um, as a single example, I think about 16 people tick the box on the sign-up that they were going to take the pledge as a part of yep. this event, which is awesome. Another 80 or so people said they were interested and that they would look into it more. That's fantastic, right? And if you think about the, um, the outcomes of, of thousands and thousands and thousands of startups, small companies that have the growth trajectory that we're all familiar with, a very small amount of that at the start can yield a very big outcome for all sorts of causes. We don't yeah, so you pick your own cause. cause you pick, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's literally just a vehicle to explain to people. There's some machinations, so we've got legal docs in Australia and legal docs in America, et cetera, how to actually do those things, but that was sort of the idea, is just to get the, try to get that rolling. And also, it creates a conversation with people and staff about, we do this, why do you do that? What do you, what do you put the money into? And it drives people down a path of taking some concrete action towards a philanthropic effort in their business, where otherwise people are like, I really want to do that, but I'm just too busy. Yep. You know, like, I'm really keen to do that, but I haven't done it yet. So, so what are the focuses for the Atlassian Foundation then? Um, largely on education, um, and now Pledge 1% is a big, big so part that, of the foundation. The whole like, education uh, it, You know, we, we've, we've had different things over time, but, but education is a big, uh, big part so of it. High school, uni? Different things in different parts of the world. So yeah. we do some things with um, you know, Aboriginal and Indigenous education uh, charities and funds in Australia. Um, we focus a lot on Cambodia. Um, we have a, a, a fair series of partners in Cambodia from Room to Read at the big end to some smaller ones that we're trying to bring up. Um, and uh, you know, the foundation is growing very rapidly alongside the company, so it's constantly re-strategizing re what it's trying yeah. to do. Okay, and I'll, I'll check it in the time after this, but this could be the last question. So, I mean, any advice? I mean, these people are sitting out there, they probably haven't done it yet. Just do it. I mean, is that a bit twee? Is that just get um, on with it? Just do it, do it for the right reasons, right? Like, I think most people genuinely feel like, yeah, I, I want to do that. It, it's a very easy thing to do, actually. You, you don't need to solve. People get into the mental loop of trying to pre solve. Well, I've got to think where I'm going to put the money and then how much will there be? Get, there's nothing right now. So, just pledge it and then figure that part out. And you'll find it really exciting as a part of that journey. Um, your employees will be highly motivated to join. People want to work in a place that has some social conscience, I would say, of a broader, broader sense. So there's a lot of externalities, but you have to do it for, for internal reasons first. I don't think you can do it to attract employees or for recruitment or any of these sorts of things. Um, and the earlier you do it, the less it, it matters, right? It, 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 um, Again, giving away 1% of something that is zero, it, it, you're never going to notice it. And that's sort of the, the, the idea. Just um, okay. yeah. look it up. It's a great website. There's lots of examples. Um, I should say thank you to all those. I think a few hundred Australian companies have already taken it. They're all on the website, so it's great. Looks like there have been some questions. Should we take one of them and then call it sure. a day? Which one do you want? The middle one, I think, is the most interesting. What are you most afraid of? Um, what keeps you up at night? Your kids, I suppose, will keep you up at night. I was going to say, four kids. Uh, uh, I was just saying, two sick ones at the moment. <laughs> Multiple beds each night, kind of travelling around. Um, uh, what are you most afraid of? That's a good question. Um, uh, I suppose stasis. Um, 
sort of stopping learning, stopping growing is, is, a, is a weird fear that I have. I think when people, um, you know, there's this big theory that the brain is sort of an unfilled vessel when you're young and it gets very rapidly filled up and your rate of learning is as rapid as the brain can absorb. And as you get older, you actually stop learning because of societal constructs. Um, so when you're at school, you literally are told, sit here for eight hours a day and learn. And so you're like, okay, that's what I guess I'll do, right? Um, and you, you, your new experiences keep piling up because everything is a new experience when you're young. And so your learning rate is very, very fast. And then you kind of get to the middle of your career and the learning rate actually slows down precipitously because you're doing the thing that you were doing last week and your job is kind of management rather than learning. It's not explicitly learning. And that, um, that scares me a lot, um, that my learning will slow down and then you reach um, uh, uh, sort of a, a stasis point, I suppose. Your, your bosses, 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 bosses. <laughs> day, day one <laughs> versus day two yeah. thing is a very good analogy, right? The fear of when do we get to day two and he's like, we don't get to day two with Amazon. We are in day one and we need to stay in day one because day two is death. Um, I think would be probably the, yeah, I mean, it's a bit, a bit of a meta answer. No, that's good. Uh, really too um, look, I think we, we probably are out of time. I'm just looking uh, over at the guys, yes. Why do I get, always get parenting questions? Yeah, <laughs> I'm really intrigued like, by the parenting well, you're questions. You're so good at everything else. Totally you're unqualified parent, to answer. Right? So, uh, I just you have peaked, so you're only 37? Uh, yes. Right. Well, I hope you haven't peaked too young. So you've still got a lot of time under your belt. Oh, That's yeah. Part of the... If you look at Facebook had six million college kids and could have said, hey, we've got a great business with six million college kids, right? And they walked away from that local maximum to find a much higher global maximum. And that necessarily means kind of going down to go back up again. Um, and I think if you look at the best businesses, they're constantly finding new local maximums and taking the pain in between. Um, and that's something that, that scares me a lot from an Alassian perspective. Like, how are we avoiding local maximums? Because you do something new and then you're optimizing the new thing, right? You send out the pioneers, they find some ground, and then you send out settlers and you put water and roads and everything else. And by the time you've got water and roads, you're like, well, I've got a pretty good town. Let's just kind of make that town bigger instead of sending out another pioneer over the next hill to make a new town. Um, and I think the best businesses and startups, and it actually doesn't matter what scale you're at, you can find local maximums. I've invested in companies that found a local maximum at five to 10 people. And we're like, well, I've got this really good business now. And it's like, well, how much are you willing to throw that away to try to find a new one? And do you really believe there's another town kind of over the hill that's bigger or better location? Or are you kind of comfortable settling? Um, I don't know if that necessarily scares me. I'm a big like, fuck it, let's go over the next hill and see what's there. But generally for other people, I think that's a really interesting way to think about your business, right? Are you approaching a local maximum? You can't constantly be pioneering. If you're just doing nothing other than sending out pioneers over hills, you're probably not gonna build any towns whatsoever and it's all gonna fall apart in a heap, right? Uh, but the balance between those two is really hard. And knowing, I think it takes true founders to really say, guys, I understand what everybody else is saying, but we are at a local maximum and I have nothing other than sheer belief that we have to move off where we are. Um, that's very, very hard to do. Yeah. And I would encourage all startups, do it at 10 people, do it again at 100, do it again at 1,000. I think that's a great place to stop. Thank you, Mike. Round of applause for Mike, thank you. Right. Thank you. Thanks, mate, good job.